Hello and welcome once again to Dave and Marlo, your absolute favoritist, or at least one of your favorite Blazers and podcasts. I'm Dave Deckard here with Marlo Ferguson in another good week to be a Trail Blazers fan. Since we talked last, Marlo, we have had four games to talk about, three of which have been wins. Let's start at the beginning. The Blazers open up in Phoenix with a baseball back-to-back. You called it as it's going to be one and one. That's exactly how it ended up, but that first game was sure something. Uh, I think that's maybe the moment when they really woke us up most as to what this early season was going to be like. What did you think when they won in Phoenix that first time. Absolutely agree with that. You know, we were looking at that that first weekend. We were just thinking, hey, if they can put another week on top of that, maybe they can start to, you know, really win some trust over it. And, and they were able to do that. And I think one thing that we've learned about this team over the last week or so, that you can never turn them off the TV, even when they're down. Uh, you look at the numbers. They trailed against the Hornets uh, by, by 12 or seven minutes ago, came back and won uh, in the third quarter. Uh, played. They trailed the Heat by 14 with five minutes ago in the third quarter, came back and won. Same thing with the Denver game, the Lakers game, the Sun game, the Kings game. They're just a, a resilient bunch. And I like the way, uh, I don't know if you've seen Justice Winslow's Twitter page. They were saying that, that they had no chance to win that game without uh, without Damian Lillard. And he kind of clapped back at him at the end of that. So I like the competitive fire they're bringing too. So just fun stuff all around. Yeah. I mean, it's really been a fantastic run. Uh, look, Phoenix came out ready in that first game, I think. Uh, Now, they didn't play consistently the whole time, but they knew that they had lost and lost narrowly in the second game of the season. They knew that Portland was the only loss on their record. Uh, They, I think, probably heard a little bit of the buzz, the early season. Okay, it's way too early, first weeks, but you know what? Hey, how about them trailblazers? How about them jazz? That was the thing, right? And Phoenix is like, okay, well, little brother, uh, you know, you got lucky, uh, but it's best two out of three here, and uh, we are ready for the rematch. And you know what? Portland came back and took him again. Uh, last minute shot, uh, you know, two point win. It was it was everything that this Blazers uh, team is about. Uh, the next night, of course, that was coming back to earth. And you know, Phoenix is not going to roll over. Phoenix is one of the best teams in the conference, even without Cam Johnson. Which, by the way, they lost Cam versus Portland in that first game. But so. You know, you didn't expect the Blazers were going to sweep them, and they didn't. But then the Blazers go to Miami, and Miami had a win against Portland uh, earlier and really handled them pretty easily. That was like the, the, the first loss, the game where you go, okay, well, they were on a little bit of a run, but the Heat are a legit team, and a legit team came into Portland, just spanked them. And I think Miami sort of felt like, you know, yeah, that's the way it should be. And that's the way it's going to be again. That's not the way it turned out. Yeah. And I, I like the way they fought in the second game. And I really thought in the first game, they, they in that first quarter, in the first half, you know, they, they played extremely well. They had an eight point lead in the, in the second quarter and had a chance to add on to that. And they just weren't able to do it. So in the second game, you were just kind of hoping that they kind of learned from those mistakes, played a little bit better. And uh, it was just, it's been a fun week in terms of just seeing how different dynamics clash. Like uh, Corey Jazz, he brought out on Twitter that the Heat were number one in zone defense this year. And you know that Portland are going to bring it right back. Uh, Miami ran 146, you know, zone possessions this year. So uh, how they responded to that was going to be kind of interesting. Um, and, and in the end, they were able to, you know, get things going. They got into the paint. Uh, Miami was, was number one in the league in terms of defending at the rim. And they got to the rim, uh, made big shots. And uh, I think the coolest thing about everything is just that, you know, like I said, this this team has had four game winners this year, none by Damian Lillard. So it's just awesome to kind of look at Jeremy Grant, Josh Hart, uh, just guys like that that are just making big shots and stepping up when they need to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Jeremy Grant had the admittedly illegal uh, shot against Phoenix. There was a lot of things that went into that win uh, for the Blazers. But again, for all of you say, Blazers always get screwed over and the refs just hate them and there's a conspiracy. Okay, no, 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 no. I mean, the refs gave Portland uh, several shots at that victory. To to their credit, Portland took it. Uh, fine. I mean, nobody's arguing with that. But uh, Jeremy Grant again had a big shot in the fourth quarter of that Miami game. And then that final possession. Uh, so the Blazers inbound it. I think some have suggested that Miami thought they were going to take a timeout. 
I don't know if Miami really thought that. I mean, who do they think has the ball? I mean, I, how are you going to get a timeout and get a better uh, possession than Damian Lillard coming down the court for the last shot? Lillard gets by one defender who lets him go, gets a step on the second defender, which then causes Miami to hit the red alert button. Miami converges on Lillard because, oh, my God, what did we do, right? And then Lillard kicks it to Hart in the corner. Hart confidently shoots uh, just a picture-perfect three-pointer as the buzzer goes off, uh, matching then Jeremy Grant's game winner in Phoenix, this time without the help of the refs. And Portland comes away with two huge wins on this road trip, courtesy of forwards, really new forwards this year. I know Hart played last year for 20 games, but you know, if new your new starting forwards have now won you minimum two games with buzzer beaters and really more than that. Not bad, right? Not bad at all. You just you see the competitive spirit with this group and you love seeing how many different guys are getting involved with the two. Uh you just look at the competitive fire of the team. They've got I look at the roster, they've got like like 10 guys that are four years and under. Uh, six guys that are five years and up. So they've got different guys that can step in and bring intensity, bring in aggressiveness, and that are just calm in the clutch. And you can take your pick. They're the, the number one team in terms of, of clutch stats across the league, right? They're talking about points, points per game, plus minus field goals. Um, and, you know, you wonder how sustainable that is because, like I said in, in the article, out of the 12 teams that have winning records, they have the 11th best uh, net rating. So I don't know if you want to continue to live on the edge like that, but, man, it's a thrilling when it's, when it's working, when it's on. Yeah, and that's that's the caveat, of course, is that eventually those games are going to go against you if you can't build more of a margin. But look, the Blazers are not playing with a full starting lineup in many of these games. The Blazers are playing against teams that are arguably better than they in many of these games. The Blazers are playing on the road now in many of these games, and they are still winning them. I mean, sure, it's a two-point win. But those factors alone probably stack eight points for the opponents. So in spirit, at least, it's kind of like a 10-point win, which you'll take. I mean, and I get it that the math doesn't add up there, but there's a non-zero chance that today's two-point win becomes next month's 10. Yeah, you just got to play it, play it game by game, I think, at this point. And I think what's most inspiring is that we're seeing this team win in multiple different ways. Like over the past week, we saw them them force feed the ball into Yusuf Nurkic to the point where he was the number one post player in terms of possessions in the league. Then they come in, they, they go in there with, without Damian Lillard. Uh, he didn't hit a single fourth quarter shot against Charlotte, and they still find a way to win. So just continuing to just chip away at it and find ways to uh, be victorious, I think is, is inspiring and reassuring in the long run. So, But as far as the clutch games, you just got to take it game by game, I think. <laughs> right. And then, then you got Charlotte, which as you point out, I think, illustrates your point about you can't turn off the TV on the on this team, right? Because, look, Charlotte took away a bit of what Portland wanted to do. And granted, Portland was a, without Yusuf Nurkic and Jeremy Grant in the starting lineup. But Drew Eubanks really stepped up. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Charlotte, and, and really many of Portland opponents, to, to take away some of what the Blazers want to do. They force some turnovers. They force, uh, you know, a few uh, outside shots that are contested, that kind of thing. And almost every team manages to do that to the Blazers for a while. But Portland's like the ocean. I mean, you you can you can dodge the waves for a minute, right? But eventually, it's going to get you. And the Blazers are just coming in waves, and eventually they get you. I mean, the the classic thing against Charlotte was, I mean, the, the Blazers got housed in the third period at the beginning. I mean, to the point where uh, a well-known Blazers commentator who almost always in, is invariably positive was going, you know, this is literally said on Twitter, this is going the way uh, that the Blazers can't handle, basically. That this is, you know, got, might be too much. And then all of a sudden, Damian Lillard's like, oh yeah, well, I guess I, I'm going to come alive here. And, uh, you know, it's been Jeremy Grant and it's been Josh Hart and it's been Anthony Simons. It's been everybody else. Uh, even Drew Eubanks, for goodness, goodness sake. Now, okay, I guess it's time to bring out me. It's like, you know, Magic the Gathering or something and you're holding back that 52 mana cost card. It's like you played all your others and they got blocked. It's like, all right, here we go. And uh, he really took over that game. He, he pulled the team out of their deficit he put the Hornets back on their heels and they never, ever looked back. And Charlotte's got to say, you know, we played 30 minutes of that 48 minute game really, really well. But that, you know, 12 or so that we played 
poorly or that Lillard took over, we had no chance. Yeah, and it's something that you hear a lot around the league. Like fans, fans will tell you, different analysts will tell you, like there's a murmur in the crowd that you can hear when when Dame hits one shot, people are like, "Oh, it's coming." And and for Blazers fans, I think it's kind of fun because you see him coming down the court. He's got to hit his theme, and they're running to one of those drag screens or whatever it is. You know he's pulling up, and if he hits one or two in a row. Uh, that's how it goes most nights. And tonight, you see what he did. All right, last night uh, in the second and third quarter, just fantastic work. I think he had 23 points over those two quarters alone, um, and they needed it every time, just keeping them in the game. And, and in the end, they were able to kind of figure it out. So it was – it's Damon Little. We've seen it so many times, but it never gets old. Yeah, absolutely. And, by the way, though, I mean – Look, this early season has been about everybody else. And obviously, Dame is doing great. He has a fantastic scoring average and all that. But there has been a little bit of that classic Dame missing a little bit. You know, I mean, and how can you say that when he's scoring 30 points a game? You obviously can't. There's nothing wrong with Dame. But you remember this, right? It's like the sizzle uh, in, in addition to the steak. The steak's been there, but the sizzle... You know, not as much. The absolute dominance, the taking over, that this is my floor and you can't stop me. Dame did that in Charlotte. I mean, this was this was as good as anything when you consider the momentum was going all the other way. Nothing was going for Portland. Nothing. And Dame's like, you don't need anything to go for you. I'm here. And it's like, there it is. And everybody's like, it's like he woke everybody up. You know, it's it's just incredible to see. And then you figure they haven't been writing that. That's literally their ace in the hole, and they haven't had to play it. Not bad. Not bad at all. I kind of liked what the uh, like the way the players were talking about it after the game. Like Chauncey Billups was saying that this game was a, a win for the young guys, just in terms of how they were getting bullied in the in the first quarter, bringing in the guys like Jabari Walker, Trenton Wofford, having them bring in that infectious energy, um, and just taking advantage of that. Wofford came in and got a couple of charges, made some great passes. Shaden Sharp was fantastic. So you like that you're seeing the different angles that you get with, with these players' wins, um, and and how many different guys they're able to bring in. And I'm really interested to see how that rotation works when they've got everybody healthy and and everybody's ready to go. Like, how do you manage to you know get all those minutes out to those guys? So that's going to be something uh, fun to watch too. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that for a second because you start this trip without uh, Damian Lillard and Anthony Simons, right? And then this last game, you inverted that. You have no Nurkic and no Grant. And then Josh Hart got kind of halfway concussed, maybe kind of, but certainly has not quite been himself at least scoring, rebounding. He's doing fine. But, yeah. okay, you've got this This starting lineup is like the blinking Christmas lights. It's it's pretty, but it's not all on at the same time. We, we haven't seen, well, I mean, we've seen it, but not consistently. We haven't seen all five of them. So let's talk about the, who stepped up? Uh, you mentioned Jabari Walker. That was Charlotte, right? Trenton Watford, also Charlotte. Drew Eubanks, Charlotte. Shaden Sharp, intermittently. He's, you know, he's, look, he's going to have a couple bad games. That's the way it goes, right? But he's also had a couple games where he's just basically ignored the opponent defense. You know, it's just like, okay, I can, I can score anytime I want. And it's like, darned if he can't. That that's four people right there who, when there were gaps, stepped into them fairly seamlessly. Even though you don't want to ride these two guys for eighty-two games right now, this is really not bad. The Blazers are getting way more out of these players than you would suspect. Absolutely, and just a note on Sharp um, coming into this game, I wrote about him shooting seven for twenty-four on dribble pull-ups, and I don't know if there's a, a shading Sharp fan seventeen or a, a shading Sharp on Blazers edge at all. But it seemed like he kind of took that to note and, and came in and, and really stepped it up in that regard. Uh, just immediately got to it, you know, the, the dribble pull-ups, uh, the two-drop floaters. You know, and, of course, he's already showing a, a great, great vision in terms of being an elite cutter. And I think that it's such a special sight when you see a player match that athleticism with with the wit and the IQ and the composure to go with it. We've seen a little bit with Keon Johnson, too. But with Sharp, I think it was just just amazing. And he had one player where he uh, kind of just outhung every, every Hornets defender as if to say, you know, we're both in the area, but I'll wait for you to come down first before I take this shot. So it was, it was, it was fantastic. And I thought uh, Kevin Calabro's call made it even better. Uh, and this is awesome to see how quickly he's been able to develop uh, in that regard. Well, the thing about Sharp, like his initial step doesn't always get him free, I think. And 
his finish needs work. But you can see in the in-between, after that, you know, if he cleans up the move or makes it a little less predictable, right, to where he can get even a quarter of a step on his defender right away, those middle moves make him near unstoppable. You can almost see the opposing defender's wheels turn in their head like, oh, crap. Like, and, and because they're not out of position to begin with, and because you kind of can time his finish, they're able to make up for it right now. But as soon as that beginning and end factor kind of clean up, I'm not sure he's going to be able to be stopped very easily. I don't think so either. And and we've said it before, like even the shots that he misses are are, are makeable shots. You know, you, there's nothing about his game that ever really feels, you know, disturbed or forced or pressured. And so that's I think that's reassuring. And the fact that he's been able to do this, regardless of who's in the lineup, who's with him, he's had times where he's done this with benefiting from Dame Lillard's attention at times where he hasn't. So uh, just seeing that. And I also think that, you know, this other guys, Jabari Walker, really play well. Uh, you know, you just go down the line, the different rookies they're able to bring in. I think it speaks speaks volumes to the way the Blazers have developed talent, how quickly they've been able to get those guys in. And uh, like I say, it's found money to have these guys playing as well this early into their careers. Yeah. Now, we haven't even covered a couple of the guys who have stepped up big. Uh, we'll save the big one for the end. But, I mean, Nasir Little. Now, he's kind of, there's a gray area here with Nas, right? When I've seen him play, I actually thought he's done pretty well. I love his shot selection this year. I think he times it. He doesn't overdo it. He's not forcing anything. He's getting to his spots. You can almost see it. Like, all right, I can see the spot like three steps from here where I'm going to pull up. And he he makes it work, right? Uh, I think his defense is still good. I mean, he may not be, he's not quite as aggressive, I think, as he came out last year. But another way of saying that is he's not quite as uncontrolled as he was last year uh, on either end. And that's actually, that calming down might be a good thing. There are fewer spectacular plays, but there are fewer missteps too. But my man shooting 52% from the field, 46% from the three-point arc. And he feels like the fifth bench player in. What's going on here? I mean, is it just so deep that that's the way it is? Or am I missing something about how well Nasir Little is doing? I think you're right on point with it. Uh, he's looked much more mature in terms of getting to his shots. I like the, the dribble pull-up that he's added this year, and his numbers are continually getting better. And I, I wrote about this a couple of days ago, too, just in terms of uh, percentage-wise, you look at it, it's almost 10% better than from a year ago. Uh, so just, just continuing to add, continue to add to his game. He's, he's not letting limits getting put on his game. Uh, defensively, I think that he's sort of – he's been a little bit – he's been good, but I thought in the Miami game, the first Miami game, was a little bit out of sync. He was getting blown by a little bit, but uh, for the most part, he, he's had those those same kind of energy plays, those hustle plays, but just adding more to his game, I think, is the biggest thing. Yeah. And, yeah, again, timing for me. You know, I, I I noticed I noticed little last year to the good or bad. He was like it was like a Price is Right game. That Plinko chip is either falling right down the middle or getting a very low number, right? And that was not like oh he did it. Oh he blew it. Oh he blew it. Oh he missed it. Oh he did it. Now it's like damn, that's that's solid. That's solid right there. I mean, and I'm this is weird, but he reminds me a little bit, not at all in style. Not at all. I'm not comparing these two in talent. I'm not comparing these two in any way It's because it's a Hall of Fame comparison versus Nas Little, all right? But he has a little Dwayne Wade confidence in his shot. Now, I'm looking, you know, he makes his move, he pulls up, and you're going like, he knows that's going in. He has no concern about this shot, and it's it's just effortless. It's, it's, it's almost thoughtless, or another way, zen. It's just... You know, and it's, it's not going to be high volume. He's not going to do this a hundred times. But when he's going up with that, I'm going like, there's nothing wrong with this. And it's exactly the way I learned to view Wade when he was in his prime. Like, there's, there's nothing wrong with any shot he takes. And I, 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 again, I feel silly because Little is way more limited and all that. But maybe this is my point, that what he's choosing to do, his selection is making him look pristine. And he's not a pristine player like that, but he's making himself look like that with his mind and his moves. 
And I really, really like that. You know what? I actually love the comparison. When you brought it up, I was I was thinking he was going to say Gerald Wallace or something like that. But the way in way, I can see that too with the, the pull-ups. And that confidence is, 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 you can see it. Every time he shoots the ball, it doesn't like he's thinking about it. He's not holding it or, or passing it. It's either a quick pass or a quick shot every single time. And um, to your point, I, I think that he's also made some strides as a passer too. Uh, he had a couple of clips, especially in that uh, Houston game and in the Miami game earlier. He was making some nice reads and you can see him kind of thinking it through what he's going to do. And he's setting up Drew Eubanks for, for lob passes and, and bounce passes and whatnot. So just seeing this is, is he's, he's playing like a guy that just got paid. I'll say that. So it's, it's, it's awesome to see him uh, continue to grow in that area. And, you know, honestly, if Josh Hart was not playing out of his head, and by the way, Hart has started to slump a little bit. And again, I don't think he's been quite the same since he got hit on the head. I don't know what exactly is going on there. But uh, I don't know if it's injury related at all or as anything, but he's been slumping a little bit this week. But before that, he was just Josh Hart was, oh, oh my God, like he, he was Batman out there. Like, I don't mean like the Batman Robins comparison. I mean, his utility belt had a lot of stuff in it, <laughs> like whatever the Blazers need is like, I got that. Hold on. I can do this. I can rebound. I can pass. I can hit the shot. I can push the tempo. I can set up the play. It's like, damn, what you <laughs> like, okay, Batman's not the right comparison. He's James Bond, right? <laughs> like, he went before the game, and he goes and sees, you know, Q or whoever the hell it is. I don't watch a lot of James Bond movies, but it gets it. Here's my pen, and here's my this, and here's my that, and everything that comes up, he's got. I will say this. If Hart was not playing exactly like this, I think there would be a big push or a bigger push for Little to have a lot more responsibility. How do you think that's going to end up working out when when they've got everybody healthy? Like, do you see? I know this Nurkic is already getting this minutes kind of kind of dipped into a little bit with with Wofford coming back and, and Jabari proving himself. Do you see it sort of changing up as far as like the, the forward rotation? How do you see that going? Now, here's the classic Blazers dilemma, right? Yeah. Because we've got a story behind the story in that Josh Hart's going to be able to opt out this year, and if you don't think he's opting out, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's enough goodwill in the in the world to get him to settle for the whatever he's making right now, 13 million or whatever, when he can renew his contract. And he's 27 years old, by the way, right now. He's literally in his prime. This is his big contract coming up. I don't think he's going to put it off another year. Here's this very typical Blazers scenario. Hart plays well, and the team does well. Until, you know, but, but Hart has a little up and down, right? But you're still going, you can't give up on him. And the team does well until the playing deadline ends. And then after the playing or the trading deadline ends, then all of a sudden you keep heart, you get nothing for him, and the team starts to slump. That would be typical Portland, and that would be the nightmare. So I think as long as Hart keeps playing well and the Blazers keep winning, that they will keep or Hart will keep a lock on that position. As long as Hart keeps playing well and the Blazers keep winning, I don't think Nas can eat into those minutes. But if Hart starts to slump, it's going to be easier to trade him. And the Blazers almost have to trade him unless they think there is a legit run in their future. I don't see, by the way, any way that they resign him because as well as he's playing, they're going to go deep into the luxury tax to do that. So let's avoid the nightmare scenario where <laughs> they play well until the trade deadline and then everything falls apart after and you didn't trade hard. Let's hope it's really clear what they need to do with him before they get there, either a championship or move him for assets. I'm almost kind of wondering if like Satan starts development, how quickly that's happened. Uh, as that sort of, it's going to change the way things kind of flow around too. Because I, I don't think that they expect him to be this great right away, or maybe at least we didn't. So I don't know. It's it's it's, it's kind of fun to think about. Th there's there's look, if the Blazers think that they can contend, you go all in to keep doing that because I mean the distance between here and there is pretty long, and if you think you're close, you, you can't change it, right? I mean, is there a future if they're not really contending but they're still good? If you look at Hart, who you got to move because you can't keep him. And you look at Anthony Simons, who is a legit scorer 
right? I mean, he's a, he can, he's a starter. He's shown this. Hart and Anthony, Anthony Simons might pull you a, a, an amazing player, and you have Shaden Sharp now going into Simon's spot, which this year, I mean, again, you figure they're not going to contend this year. But next year, you got Damian Lillard, Shaden Sharp, some kind of god-awful superstar that you got for Simons and Hart. Uh, you still have Jeremy Grant, and you still have Yusuf Nurkic. That, I mean, at that point, you start to you start to tingle a little bit, right? Now, I'm not saying that that's the right answer. I'm not saying it's a possible answer, but I'm saying there's a non-zero possibility of that, right? Yeah, everything just everything's in play right now, just just based on the way the roster is right now. And uh, I, I guess one thing that kind of benefits them is that they have so many different guys this year in Chauncey Billups' system that are able to play different positions. This team is absolutely positionless at this point. Um, and I can note on, on Justice Winslow immediately comes to mind and just how he's been able to play everything from, from one to five, defending everything from one to five. Uh, earlier this week against Miami, he was part of the reason why they won that game, putting him in the small ball lineup and winning that, uh, bringing energy, playing the one. Uh, there was a stat that showed that he was the, the 16th most versatile defender in terms of defending every position around the league. So you got Jeremy Grant playing point guard. Uh, it's allowing Dame Lillard to play more off ball. It's, it's been really fun to see how they've been able to just influx different guys in. Um, I don't know. I'm just excited to see how that's going to play out too. Yeah. And there is some interlocking with this uh, lineup, especially since they're so willing to play small because guess what? They don't have a lot of other choice, right? So, the, the fact that they've been able to mix those and make it work has been great. Now, there's, there are a few other guys we've got to talk about. I mean, Drew Eubanks, every time he comes in for use of Nurkic and gets pressed into duty, it's fine. You know, uh, again, is, the, is he going to start for you? Probably not. But you on paper, you're going, oh, wow, Nurkic is in foul trouble or Nurkic is injured. And you got to bring Eubanks in. Ha ha, there's a weakness. No, he's setting screens. He's grabbing rebounds, and honestly, he's taking only the shots that he should take, and he's not hesitating a bit. He's shooting 69%, almost 70% from the field. So it's like, uh, okay, you know, he's only taking three shots a game, but obviously those are the exact three shots he should take. Uh, I, th This is amazing, you know? And, and by the way, uh, Nurkic is scoring 13 points a game in about 30 minutes, right? Eubanks is scoring seven in 15. So, oh, yeah. like, I mean, he's scoring at pretty much the same rate as Nurkic is, just taking fewer shots. Uh, I'm not saying in any ways he's going to replace Nurkic, but you like what Drew's doing, right? Absolutely. He's a, a fan, I think he's a fantastic pick and roll player, too, just in terms of how he can roll, continue to make plays, a hustle guy at that, so... I think the one big thing about having guys like these, like this, these are uh, journeymen, right? You're talking about uh, Drew Eubanks, Justice Winslow. These are guys that kind of know their role. They know they're not going to get a, a huge payday at this point in their career. So you want to see as much of this course stick around as you possibly can and see who they can be. And guys like that, I think they're going to they're gonna make that a little bit easier as far as the contracts they sign in the future um, and then going forward like that. Right. And Wilsonville Drew wants to be here, right? I mean, he, you know, he's, he's you knew he wanted to be here last year. He loved it. I, I, Go back to something I said about, you know, towards the end of the season last year when the Blazers were winning like two games in 40 tries. But Drew Eubanks is playing hard every play. Drew Eubanks is talking to coaches. Drew Eubanks is up off the bench applauding. He wanted to be here. And I get it. Part of it, like, let me get my contract renewed or whatever, obviously had incentive to be here. But you know what? He was in the right place and he did the right thing. And he's still doing that, even though he has a contract. and. Just you, you cannot replace that. And by the way, I think it is also true of Trendon Watford. By the way, I think it is also true of Jabari Walker, even though he's a rookie draftee or whatever. I think you've got guys on the bench now who are going, you know, this is a good place to be, and this is a fun team to be on, and I'm in my spot. And you look back for all the players that the Blazers have brought in, you know, uh, Look, a lot of them were good. Mo Harkless, sure. I mean, he did great. Al Farouk Aminu, great. You know, fine. But did they really have that? You know, did they, did you really, Trevor Ariza, did Trevor Ariza really want to be here? Was he going like, yeah, this is my spot. I love this more than any other. No, 
right? I mean, I don't, I wasn't in his head, but this is a journeyman, right? I mean, he's going to travel around, play for whoever pays him. These guys are young, motivated. What, what more could you ask for? Let's give a quick shout out to Jabari Walker too. Uh, he was a plus 22 plus minus in 17 minutes yesterday. Shaden Sharp was a plus 30 in 29 minutes of action. So both of those guys were, were amazing. And, and you look at Jabari Walker, he said in an interview yesterday, he was, he, he's not even sure when to shoot. So these guys are still kind of learning their own strengths at this level right now. Uh, and I think on top of what you said about them wanting to be here, just the fact that they've got the right kind of veterans leading, leading the way, as far as that goes, is, is, is very inspiring. And uh, you just love the camaraderie, too. I think in this interview yesterday, Justice Winslow was the one interviewing him. So you see the bond there with these guys and just how quickly they're getting to work. Um, it's really exciting stuff. And I, I like I like what I've seen from Jabari Walker, too, just in terms of the rebounding. Bill said yesterday that they, they – had to make a change because they were getting beat on the glass and he trusted those guys, these guys 10 games into their careers, able to come in and make these plays. And, um, very excited to see what Jambari Walker does in his future too. Yeah, and such a critical vulnerability the Blazers have rebounding. I mean, night in and night out, that's their potential weak spot. You've got to give a hand to Yusuf Nurkic. you got to give a hand to Josh Hart. And you're right, those forwards and bigs coming off the bench who come off the bench to do that. Because if that were not happening, if that one factor were going different, in fact, we don't have to say if it was. Sometimes it does. I mean, you saw that, right, against uh, Charlotte. Like, they were, the off, I think they had like 11 offensive rebounds in the first half or some ungodly something was going on. And when the Blazers cannot control the rebounds, they do not control the tempo. And, of course, their defense is not near as good, Right. This one factor makes a huge difference, and they are policing those boards like crazy. And that was not expected. And you can see the opponents tee up like, ha, 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 you know, we've got them here. And it's like, well, you thought you did, but we stayed even at least. And that's all we need to do, because if we can stay even, then the rest of our game and our overall talent puts us ahead. Yeah, and the Hornets commentators were actually saying, like, at the end of the first quarter, like, this is the best offense we've seen all year. So for the Blazers to be able to plug that up for the next two quarters, I think it speaks volumes to Chauncey Billups and his ability to make adjustments to being able to recognize these things quickly, making rotations, subbing the right guys in and out. So yep. um, to that note, I, I think that, you know, just, just looking at the Pelicans game, I'm kind of sad that we're not going to get to see that that McCollum versus uh, Lillard matchup that we've been kind of waiting for. But also it's going to be interesting to see because of the fact that the, the, the Pelicans are the league's best offensive rebounding team. So the Blazers were going to be in a very tough challenge as far as that goes and how they were going to deal with that. So uh, that's going to be a fun thing to keep eyes on too tonight. Right. Uh, continuing down the roster, how how bad is this for Greg Brown? I mean, Greg Brown's going like, dude, I'm shooting 72% almost, you know? I'm shooting 72% from the floor. And I can jump out the gym. I mean, I may have, I may have the most reach of anybody here. Even you know, Sharp and uh, you know, uh, Keon Johnson, who've got their huge four foot vertical leaps. But I'm, I got that, and I'm tall, and I can't get on the floor. What the hell, <laughs> right? I, I'm one of the great young hopes, and I'm you know there. I mean, he's not really, but you know what I mean. It's scary how deep this team is with players that you've never heard of. <laughs> Right. Of the team that should not be deep, that we're going, oh, my gosh, it's all clicking. Well, except for uh, well, let's get to a couple other players. Keon Johnson, he's been a little hit and miss. There have been moments, I th you know, against Phoenix, I think he had a decisive game. And there have been moments when when he's helped turn it around, especially defensively. The offense, so so the his role in the offense seems a little shaky. He's one guy who appears to force it sometimes. Right, not making a lot of plays um, for other people or fitting in hugely. I don't know. What do you think of Keon? Oh, uh, Keon's an interesting player. Like I said, I kind of look at him and, and Sharp in a similar way that they're they're trying to trying to figure out a way to get their athleticism and kind of match the the composure they have. And with Johnson, it's been interesting because I think that on occasion he takes a tad too many three pointers, and he's not at the right you know volume consistency to be hit, shooting as many as he does. I like that Chauncey Billups trusts him, especially in late-game situations, as we've seen in that, that Memphis game and in the Houston game, too. Um, but I don't know. I just don't feel like there's enough minutes to go around for all of these guys. And uh, Greg Brown's another guy that, you know, you, you sort of look at and you think, man, he's got so much talent, so much athleticism, but there are guys that maybe fit this group better. So I don't want to give up on Johnson, but I think that there are some things, like he, he, I think he needs to become a better pull-up shooter. 
but he does things that benefit this team absolutely. And you just want to see him continue to, to move, move it along as he continues to age. Talk about pressure defense. Talk about the ability to uh, force turnovers. I mean, he can do it. And it's funny because, like, it's not like he's a defensive stopper at this point. And, in fact, you know, I don't think he he might not be as good as a little is in that way. But if you need, like, a play and you say, like, go get that guy, like, go get that guy this play, Keon Johnson is as good as anybody. And he will absolutely pursue. He will get right up in your grill. He will move his feet. He will move his hands. Like there's something there that's a little spark that's special. It just doesn't come out as much. Uh, yeah. So the other guy, the guy we've left for last probably because he's the guy who's just blossoming uh, in this kind of every man, all the plays, all the time role is Justice Winslow. And solid defender, solid rebounder, setting up people. I mean, 3.3 assists in 25.5 minutes. Now, that's not a huge number, right? You know, like as far as like aggregate, but he, you know, for Justice Winslow, that's a lot. He's he's actually tied for third on the team in assists per minute. And that's Justice Winslow. Like, okay, who? Like, you know, you knew he had a package of athleticism that he could rebound and that he could sometimes defend pretty well, too. But seriously? Playmaker? Seriously? He's dribbling the ball? I mean, what the, what's gotten into justice? On both ends of the floor, he's just been as versatile as it gets. You know, I, I, I talked about it a little bit earlier, just the defensive versatility. There are a few guys in the league that are doing what he's doing on a night-to-night -night basis in terms of defending different guys. And Jeremy Grant, he's a, he's a guy that kind of stands out in terms of, you know, Chauncey Bills who usually have him guarding the, the best point guard, best perimeter best perimeter player. But on the other end, Winslow is doing the same thing too, taking on every assignment that's given to him. Um, and I, I just, you just love the versatility. And he's a guy that he's been around the NBA. So I think he kind of has different messages that you can tell to the younger guys and they're, they're going to respond to it better. So I think he's a, a very welcome addition. When they first got him last year, I thought he was going to be a one-year one year player and they were going to get rid of him after this year. But he just continued to elevate his game and, and it doesn't get spoken of as much as it probably should. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, let me put an asterisk on this. You know that per-minute assist that I gave you? Number one is Trendon Watford, who doesn't play. You know what I mean? So you got Damian Lillard at 5.3 assists per 36, according to basketball reference, right? 5.3 assists per 36. That's pretty good. Justice Winslow is tied with Josh Hart second at 4.7, which is 0.6 of an assist per 36 off of the team leader, off of the starting point guard, Justice Winslow. And you, you'd expect that from Hart, maybe. That's still really damn good for Hart. You know that, right? I mean, he's he, he's not a point guard. Uh, he just plays one on TV sometimes. But, you know, you, you know that's in Hart's portfolio, that he can move the ball. Really? Justice Winslow? And you know who's next? Jabari Walker. Okay. These, these forwards... Like, and, and look, you understand that the, the guards are going to need outlets, but what have been the outlets in years past? Uh, Nicola Batum or Trevor Ariza or Al Farouk Aminu standing in the corner, waiting for the ball, one job, shoot a three, right? When that ball goes out there, it's not coming back, all right? The forwards are not only involved in the offense— they're involved not just as an endpoint in the offense, but as a conduit in the offense. And by the way, the guy that we thought was going to do that was Yusuf Nurkic, right? Yusuf Nurkic has 3.1 assists per 36 and also 3.1 turnovers per 36. So he's like basically a non-factor as far as net there, right? Winslow is 4.7 versus 2.0. I mean, that's that's more than 2 to 1. That's 2.5 to 1, basically. That's amazing. Hart's the same way. Wow. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's been it's been fun over the last couple of years looking at uh, NBA.com. They do tracking statistics where they show how many passes are made per game. And every single year in the Damon CJ era, this team was was last. And it's been kind of fun to look at that. This year, I think last time I checked, they were like 19th or 20th, which isn't good, but it's still a welcome welcome a progression in terms of what we've been over the last couple of years. And just seeing guys be able to fill out so many different areas and things that they can excel at 
it's exciting to see. And I, I've noticed that it's allowed a guy like Damian Lillard to be played more off ball. We can run horn sets. He can uh, screen for screen for forwards. You know, it's, it's kind of different. They you see a guard screen for a forward, but just the different dimensions that it's given this Blazers offense is, is, is great. And I think it's going to allow them to be a little bit less predictable. I think that's what we're starting to see against teams like Phoenix, against Memphis, against Miami, where they're, they're competing with these top tier teams because, you know, you can't really just okay in on a, a Damian Lewis pick and roll every single play or a CJ McCollum pick and roll every play. And it's just, it's more predictable and it's more exciting to watch as an, as an observer too. Exactly. Now that we've been through the roster, let me ask you about the big factor that people are talking about. I have opinions on this, but I want to hear yours. Turnovers. Uh, Blazers are last in the league, worst in the league in turnovers committed. Um, what what do you think is the cause of that? And I, I will tell you this, that there's a debate going on. There are some people who think this is a fatal error or a fatal flaw because of the roster construction. There are other people who think that this is because the Blazers are playing a faster pace. And there are some people who think that this is just a temporary glitch because of familiarity and early season. Where do you fall on the spectrum of these? If there's a pie chart of those, how much do you think each factors in? I think it's definitely that third one. Just the guys, you know, getting more familiar with each other. Uh, even if you look at the top of the roster, the guys like Damian Lillard and Anthony Simons, they hadn't really played a lot of time together. So just getting guys, you know, familiar with each other, understanding different sets. And Chelsea's talked about this in, in, in press conferences where guys are just trying to make the home run play instead of trying to just do what's, what the right play is. And I think that there's a temptation to do that because of the athletes on this team, the different highlight makers on this team. You want to see those huge plays all the time. So just calming that down, I think it's going to be something that we see this team do as the year progresses. And if you look at the pace, the Blazers actually don't really play a, a really fast pace. They're like 24th, 24th in pace this year out of 30 teams. So it kind of it's kind of deceiving in that area. I think the biggest thing is just they need to slow down um, and just let let the play come to them. I think we'll see that kind of get better and better as the year as the year progresses. Yeah, I, I think that is actually accurate. That And actually, they're down to 26 now. I think the pace excuse is not there because they are not playing, playing fast. And even before, I mean, granted, we're, we're 10 games in. Every game's going to have an outsized effect, okay? So none of these numbers are, are going to be stable at this point. But even before that Charlotte game where they played kind of slow, uh, they, they were not they, – they were – as you say, bottom third in pace. They're not really playing faster. They're just fast breaking when they can. Uh, and that makes it look better compared to the Terry Stotts era when it never happened. But they're still not playing fast. I do not believe the turnovers are because they're playing faster. Um, I'm not entirely convinced it's because of roster construction. I think that Yusuf Nurkic is a kind of a walking turnover. Uh, and also, Jeremy Grant can be spotty. OK, uh, it, it depends on the game and what Grant is trying to do. I think those are those are the holes there. Everybody else is going to be OK. And I think the Blazers can live with those, by the way. But it, it is the it's the familiarity. It's the style. It's the plays. It's the reading defense. It's the opposing team reading you, too, because let's face it, sometimes even with all the things we've been talking about, sometimes when the Blazers get backed in a corner, they can get pretty predictable. OK, but. Do you agree with me that a lot of this turnover problem is probably going to resolve itself? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, like I say, it's just a continuity uh, getting guys involved. And I think if you look at the, some, of, some of the turnovers they've had, they've been just guys overthinking it, uh, trying to do too much. And I noticed, and especially in that Memphis game, where they were just – some of the passes weren't, weren't accurate. And then there's also the focus on this year's uh, traveling issues and the, and the, the carrying. The, the referees are kind of got an eye on that this year. And in that game in particular, they had, you know, four or five different different situations where that, that was kind of that was sort of the, the reason for those turnovers. So just simple things like that. I think that, you know, guys getting more familiar with each other, when guys are gonna cut. Um and that could be it too. There's, there's a lot more cuts this year. And when you have more cuts, you know, there's more uh more focus on trying to get guys in the right spots, hitting them on the hitting them, hitting them in stride. So as the year progresses, I definitely see that that changing up. And I think it's important to remember this this team started out with a very tough schedule in terms of what they played defensively. So all of those things, you know, in a bunch, things can help them become better uh, as the year progresses. Yeah, I agree. Now, there are a couple other factors here while we're on it. I think turnovers are going to get better. That's their Achilles heel clearly right now, 
I mean, 30th in the NBA. You literally can't get worse. But I think they will come up from that. Now, do I think that they're always going to commit some? Sure. But I think they're going to average out. I mean, they're going to be somewhere in the middle of the pack, probably. Uh, I also think, you know, their effective field goal percentage is, I mean, effective field goal percentage is two-pointers and three-pointers, you know, factored in to create kind of a, a benchmark, okay? And they are ninth in the NBA. I think that's going to remain high. And I think that's part of their, first of all, their offensive scheme, but also reflective of the players that they have. Um, I think, you know, Jeremy Grant doing well and Yusuf Nurkic doing well offensively are lifting that up. I don't anticipate them doing terribly, and I don't anticipate the Blazers riding them uh, enough for them to sink that number. So I think that's probably going to be okay. The two I have questions on, whether they can remain so high, Portland's offensive rebounding rate is ninth in the league. And, I mean, sure, that's only barely top third, but it's still top third. That I did not anticipate, and that I wonder if they can keep up, along with their over, overall rebounding rate is seventh. And that seems pretty high to me still. If they can keep that up, they're going to be really dangerous, but I expect that to average out. The other thing that's really boring them right now, and again, small sample size, but they are seventh in defensive efficiency in the league. That also seems pretty high to me right now. If they can keep that up, they will do very, very well. If that goes down to where I'd expect it to be, 15, 16, 17, maybe if they do poorly, 20th, I think they become much more ordinary. Obviously, if it drops way down, it's a disaster. But to me, those are the two things that are really on an upper or lower extreme that might not stay there. Well, three things with the turnovers. What do you think of all that? Um, to your first point, I definitely think that the offensive rebounding is going to stay that way. Um, just in terms of the shots they shoot and, and the guys they've got coming in on the glass, you know, you've got probably the, the league's best rebounding guard in Josh Hart. I'm not sure how much competition there is there, but just the mentality that Chauncey Billups has these guys playing with. You've got guys that are hunting the, hunting the glass, playing with hustle, uh, just continuing to be aggressive in that area. So that's something that I think is going to continue to be that way. And it surprises me, too, because a lot of times when you see that with, with teams, most teams that do that are, are teams that shoot a lot of three-pointers. Where you get long rebounds, you can also that wear out. The Blazers aren't a team that shoots, shoot a lot of three-pointers. But just the adjustments that they make and the aggressiveness they play with, I think it's going to give them a chance there. Um, and then to that, to the other point, um, what was it, the defensive, defensive efficiency? Yeah, they are seven right now. I think so, too, um, just because they've got different principles in place. You know, the zone defense knocks teams out of rhythm. I don't think that you know, it's as effective as maybe we think it is, but we, we've, we've heard them talk about how I can just knock a team out of rhythm um, and, and take them out of their flow. But um, I think I think it's something that can stick with you because every single night they have a different focus. And I like in that Memphis game, they, they kind of looked at Memphis, uh, their best strength was their fast break offense, and they took that away completely. They only had nine fast break points. So every night they're focusing in on what's the most important thing and they're um, just able to take advantage of it. So I think that's definitely sustainable in the long term. Yeah. You've got to like this start. I mean, there's no reason not to like this start. If the Blazers lost against New Orleans and Dallas, you'd still like this start. I mean, there's nothing. Absolutely. They're playing with house money right now. Uh, what do you expect? Uh, we have New Orleans tonight. I mean, that'll be old by the time this podcast airs on Saturday. Just quickly, do you think it's a win or a loss against the Pelicans? Oh, you say the next one. What was their schedule again? You got New Orleans, you got Dallas, and then home versus San Antonio. So New Orleans, obviously, that's tonight. Uh, it's going to be done. It's going to be history by the time people hear this. Do, do you expect that to be a win? I am expecting – I'm expecting that to be a win. I think they have enough to kind of deal with that even without name. You know, you're feeling a lot better after, after they've played without them the last couple of weeks, the last couple of games. So okay. um, I'll go in there. I think the Dallas game is, is sort of a, a, a tricky one, so I'll go with the loss there and then against San Antonio. I'll go with the win there. So two and one, some way, shape, or form, I think they're going to bounce off two and one. That would leave them ten and four after fourteen, which is, I mean, that if that happens, that would be, I would say, unimaginably good compared to what we feared would happen. I think optimistically, you thought they would be a couple games over five hundred. Ten and four, I mean, from your lips to God's ears, that would be amazing. Then you look at the schedule after that, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but you got 
Brooklyn and Utah at home, both of which at this point you think would probably be winnable. Kevin Durant always scares you. Utah is the other Cinderella team early in the season. But, you know, when Cinderella beats Cinderella or meets Cinderella, you know, somebody's glass slipper is going in someone's ear. And I think Portland being at home uh, can probably stick it to Utah. Then it gets a little tough again for a second at Milwaukee, at Cleveland. But then you've got at the Knicks, at the Nets. I mean, wow, we could be, uh, you know, 18 games. And you got the two L.A. teams. You could be 20 games in the season and have maybe 15 wins if it comes as you predict. So that would be what the hell. You know, that would that was the that was the hard part. I mean, there there are other stretches, but this was the hard part. If they come out 14 and six or 15 and five. Wow. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And I know they've got another road trip coming up at the end of this month. So having guys like, you know, Gary, Gary Payton second coming back uh, and, and just everybody else coming, getting in the flow. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how that that plays out too into the, into the situation. But it reminds me a lot of that 2013-14 um, year when, when LaMarcus and Dame were there where like nobody had them in the in the postseason race at all. And they ended up starting off the year like 22-4 and four, and just they were the surprise of the, of the NBA. So I'm not saying that's what it's going to be this year, but it, it's very reminiscent to that where they, they've kind of silenced all of their doubters. And I'm still maybe a week or two away from from really, really buying into them. Because like I said, these close losses, you know, I mean, close wins, you just hope that they sustain themselves. But they can get some convincing wins out of this next next couple of next couple of weeks. I think we feel a whole lot better about them as a whole. Yeah. And look, people see, say the NBA season is a marathon, granted. But I think for the Blazers this year, it's a steeplechase. You know, that one with the big bars and the puddles and pools that they run through and jump over in the Olympics. And... What's happened is the early season for the Blazers was a huge hurdle with a pit full of water on the other side of it. And you're going, even if they clear this, now, first of all, they could trip and end up face first in that water. But even if they clear this, they're going to get all soggy, right? And they're basically walking on water at this point. There's a non-zero chance that they come out of this first pit with their sneakers barely wet. And then you go, okay, well, if this isn't winning. They haven't, they haven't done it. But that big obstacle that would have kept them out of the lead or made them fall way back, they actually cleared it with flying colors. At that point, I think you can start to get somewhat excited about the possibilities of earning a decent seed. You Usually you look about between 20 and 25 games and go, this team, these teams have started to show you who they are. Let's watch what it is around the 20-game mark and up to about 25 and and let's let's see but i'm starting to get um i'm starting to get tingly a little bit yeah and i think the one thing you just hope for is that you don't see regression i mean we've seen like year after year in the, in the dame cj slots era we've seen them start slow and then kind of ease their way into it where like the second half of the year they got hot so you just hope that they don't see the reverse of that where they start off hot and then uh, you know get being ended up you know starting slow finishing slow um, so just that part of it, you just want to continue to see them just be consistent with that, take it game by game. And I think this is the right group for that. You know, if we learn anything about them over this first two weeks. Yep, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's always fun to do podcasts when it's like this. Let's hope it's like this again next week. Uh, Zion Williamson, Luka Doncic, let's see what happens. And, uh, hopefully we'll be able to be even more excited then. For Marlo Ferguson, I am Dave Deckard, and we will see you again next Saturday on the Dave and Marlo Show.